Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial, a museum and research center dedicated to preserving and presenting the history of General Douglas MacArthur, which includes the story of World War I and that of the millions of men and women who served in that war. In April 2017, the MacArthur Memorial and the Hampton Roads Naval Museum hosted a World War I symposium that focused on America's entry into World War I. Al Barnes, the Virginia National Guard Command Historian, presented this talk entitled, To Hell with the Kaiser, America Prepares for War. To Hell with the Kaiser, America Prepares for War. Really? This was a, this was a picture that was used to try and impress the people how ready the American army was to go fight the Germans. And when I look at it, as after spending 30 years in the military, it scares the hell out of me. I, <laughs> These guys, you know, they're very earnest, they're clean cut, but man, there are no two uniforms that are alike. Uh, some of these guys look like they're wearing their grandfather's uniforms. Uh, one side uh, note on this is the reason the uniforms are all dyed so differently was because the Germans controlled all the great patents for dyeing uniforms. And when they left the States in 1914, because they knew things were going to get rough, they took the patents with them. And we couldn't figure them out because they left them in code. So you'll see a lot of different shaded uniforms as we go through this. So to hell with the Kaiser, and here's our answer to the Kaiser. Well, here's another answer to the Kaiser. And this guy is, you know, he's got the American flag. He's got his rifle. He's got his campaign hat. The only problem is, look what he's wearing. That's an Indian Wars uh, belt and McKeever cartridge box. And if you take a little closer look at him, he's only got one collar disc, and he's got it on sideways. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure the Kaiser was scared. Now, these two guys, the guy on the left, he actually looks pretty sharp in uniform. Looks pretty good, good hat, good uniform. But he's got a rifle that is so obsolete that we didn't even use it except for training and teaching bayonet practice. The guy on the right is a New York National Guardsman. And, and I think he looks like he should be following Sherman through Georgia more than getting ready to, to take on the Western Front. Because remember, who's waiting for these guys? You know, the technically most superior army in the world. I mean, these guys had machine guns. They made up for their manpower shortages by using new tactics, by, by equipping their soldiers with, with, with machine guns, with gas, with flamethrowers, with fantastic aircraft. So this is a challenge. So what were we going to do about it? Well, fortunately, before the war started, there were actually a few guys that were out there thinking about what, what they needed to do. And one of them was the chief of ordnance. And, and he saw that our army being a total between active guys and National Guard was only 200,000 men for the entire army. He didn't care. He started stockpiling weapons. Every year he'd go to Congress and ask for more artillery than he needed. And he'd just put it in a warehouse, figuring someday we'll need it. So he was a pretty smart guy. Uh, the representative from New Jersey, the same way. Every year he'd go to Congress, get another funding for rifles. So actually when, they, when the war started, we had 900,000 rifles on hand for a 200,000-man army. So that was – had a couple of these guys out there that were thinking ahead. Uh, also – some of the regular Army and National Guard troops actually began practicing working together. Now, that's a shock, as our other National Guard guys will tell you, that we've gone through periods where the National Guard was the orphan, and, you know, we were allowed to see new equipment as the Army drove it by our, our armories. But, <laughs> but there were guys that were thinking along this line that this was going to be an important war and we'd be in it together. Then in 1916, with Woodrow Wilson and his new Secretary of War, Newton Baker, uh, they, they reformed the army, and they said, look, we've got to get ready to be a modern army. This business of being a small army with regiments in the Philippines and in China, it's just not going to get it. We need to get bigger. We need to standardize. We need to bring the guard guys in, make their ranks equivalent. We need to get them all fired up so that when the whistle blows, we all go out the door together. Now, this was a pretty good deal, but, you know, there, there was a song back in the, in the 60s called The Happening by the Supremes. Well, this is one of those ooh, and then it happened moments in history. We have the 1916 Defense Act, and then it happened. Pancho Villa. 
we had barely got the ink dry on the paper of the Defense Act and Pancho Villa crossed the border on 9 March and attacked Columbus, New Mexico. Now, we won't go into a lot of the Pancho Villa stuff today because, again, we're talking about preparing to go to, to France. But in a way, Pancho becomes one of the grandfathers of the modern American army because by forcing General Pershing to go down into Mexico to chase him under orders from, from President Wilson and General Funston, Pershing brings with him all the regular army. He's got these guys spread out through Mexico. Now, and I don't know about you, but when I used to read about Pancho Villa and Pershing, I kind of had an idea he'd crossed 20 miles into Mexico and they had a shootout and nothing much happened. Boy, look how wrong you can be. He was 500 miles deep. The farthest point into Mexico, Pershing sent his troops was 500 miles into Mexico. Now, that's a distance between here and Utica, New York. So that's a pretty significant distance. But in doing this, he took the entire regular army with him, all the cavalry. They had to shut down the artillery schools so that they could have artillery officers to go with them. He had the infantry. And yet the attacks still kept taking place on the border. Other bands were crossing the border into Texas and Arizona and attacking American towns. So what's going to happen? They had to call out the National Guard. And so the National Guard from every state was activated and sent to the border, except one state. Only one state didn't send their National Guard to the border, and that's because they didn't have one. The state of Nevada had never gotten around to actually making the National Guard. So when they got the telegram from, from Newton Baker saying, send your guard to the border, they said, we don't have one, but we'll send some college students. <laughs> uh, Baker said, no, thanks. We'll, we'll, we'll get on without you. Now, the embarrassing part of all this is, once upon a time, Pancho Villa was our friend. If you look at the guy on the right, the big heavyset army general here on the right, that's General Hugh Scott. He's the chief of staff of the army, and he's hanging out with Pancho because Pancho was seen in 1914, 1915 as a good guy. He was one of our guys. In fact, Hollywood sent a movie crew down to film him reenacting one of his great battles against the, the Mexican government. So... So there's always kind of this dichotomy with Poncho. But because of Poncho, we had to learn to work together. So the National Guard and the regular Army spent seven and a half, eight months on the Mexican border training. For the first time ever, the New Hampshire National Guard artillery came down, got combined with the Virginia National Guard artillery, and became a single brigade. It was this time spent on the border, which wasn't fun. I mean, there was, they weren't allowed to actually cross into Mexico to chase Poncho. So they had to spend their time guarding the border and training. So they went on long endurance marches. They started using motor vehicles. And they actually started using their first aircraft. If you're a World War II historian, you'll notice that, that General Giroux, who was rated one of the top five generals by, by uh, Eisenhower. We also had some other famous Virginians. Uh, on the far right is General Waller. Uh, Waller was a lawyer. He was the mayor of Front Royal. And then he became the adjutant general of Virginia for almost 30 years. Uh, he, was, he was a regimental commander in the, in the First World War. On the far left is another famous uh, Virginian, Shepard Crump. He's kind of important because he also became the adjutant general of Virginia. Uh, the guy in the middle is, uh, is a guy named John Cutchins, who nobody's ever heard of, and yet he's probably one of the more important guys here. He was the chief of staff of the 29th Division, he was also the guy who wrote the history of the 29th Division, and he served for years as the chief of staff for the 29th, even in peacetime. And even though he was badly gassed in World War I, he was so smart that uh, he was one of the, the guys that Pershing sent into Germany as a lawyer to work on war reparations. So Cutchins is really kind of an important guy in Virginia history. Um, Crump is important also because uh, our current adjutant general, uh, General Williams, his grandfather was Crump's driver. So you can kind of see it's the great American story. The guy goes from, you know, the grandson of the driver is now the adjutant general of Virginia. But every mission must end sometime. In February 1917, General Funston gets orders. Bring the boys home. The guard needs to come home. They've been on the border too long. And Baker says to the press, 
look, there's no reason, we're not bringing them home because of all this stuff going on in Europe. Take a look at the dates, though, February 1917. I, I think Baker was, was faking it, but, but to the guard guys, hey, we're going home. Now here's, this was taken in Richmond, and this is the 1st Virginia Cavalry. Now the 1st Virginia Cavalry was a unique unit. Remember back in 1916 when they took all the guard units and federalized them and gave them same ranks and same equivalents? The Virginia Cavalry at that time was the Richmond Light Infantry Blues. They were kind of a semi-official militia unit. And they were really, they'd been light infantry for 150 years and were very proud of it. They were very social, had fancy uniforms. And so when the time came to send the guard to the border, they weren't on the list. So, heck, how can we send the guard to the border and you're not taking us? We're the light infantry blues. We're famous. I said, well, we got all the infantry we need. We need cavalry. These are long borders. We need to patrol long borders. We need guys that can be cavalrymen. We got all the ground pounders we can stand. So what did the light infantry blues do? They went out. They bought horses. Made themselves a cavalry unit. <laughs> they became the first Virginia cavalry. And so uh, off they went to the border. Now, the, the fun story is they went to the border with some 98 horses and came back with 165. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and now that's funny, and I, that's a great story. But now here's the other side of the coin. You're the governor of Virginia. You're the adjutant general of Virginia. And these guys who are highly politically powered come back, and they got 165 horses. What do you do with the horses? Their armory is in right in downtown Richmond. You can't miss it. it. It's where the old 6th Street Marketplace used to be. So there's no place for 165 horses. So the governor's got to figure out where to put them. So where the fairgrounds is today, that's where they stashed the horses till they could figure out what to do with them. And, you know, they, they treated their time on the border as for what it was. It was a great training period. They all gave each other medals. They all became very proud of their service on the border. But a lot of the units, when they came home, found out that they weren't going home. They went right back to work. They stayed in uniform and had to go guard uh, railheads, industrial plants, ports. In fact, some of them were even as far up as Pennsylvania guarding important bridges, expecting the Germans to attack any minute. And like I said, that was actually not too bad a duty. As, as guys will tell you, you know, let's see, I can either be in Mexico guarding the border and chasing rattlesnakes, or I can be in Pennsylvania living in an armory guarding a bridge. Not bad duty. And so it was like a summer vacation, but summer was gonna, summer came to an end with the declaration of war. So what's the first thing you're gonna do if you're gonna go to war in Europe against the most modern army in the world? You better get big, bring all your friends, bring all your friends' friends. And so what we're gonna do is we'll take a look at how this army was built but first, we've got to find somebody to lead this army. So here are our candidates. We've got Frederick Funston. Frederick Funston is a little tiny guy, but incredibly brave. This guy is a Medal of Honor recipient for what he did in the Philippines and what he did in Cuba. He had a history of passing himself off as a native peasant to sneak into places. He led a guerrilla band in Cuba against the Spaniards. He captured a, a, a key guerrilla leader in the Philippines. This guy is just an all-round, hard-charging hero. Here's the next candidate, another Medal of Honor recipient, a unique guy. Leonard Wood is a, he's actually a doctor. He, is a, he became a contract doctor to the Army out in the West, and when one of the officers in the unit he was assigned to was incapacitated, he took over and led the 200 soldiers of that unit to chase down Geronimo. Medal of Honor recipient, personally brave, very close personal friend of Teddy Roosevelt because he was with him in the Rough Riders. Uh, Multi-talented guy. He uh, was sent to Georgia Tech to, to run the ROTC program, saw these guys playing some game out in the field and said, what is that? And they said, well, it's football. He said, that looks like fun. So what does he do? He becomes the head coach for the Georgia Tech football team and plays on the team and beats Georgia for the first time in the history of Georgia Tech. So this guy can do everything. 
And then the third choice, you've got General Pershing. Pershing is just coming off the, uh, the punitive expedition, chasing Poncho. Wasn't completely successful, but he'd done a good job. He kept after it. Poncho never came back. So Pershing is, is a good guy. He's also politically connected. His wife was the daughter of the Wyoming Republican senator. Now, Pershing suffered a terrible tragedy just before the campaign when his wife and his three daughters were killed in a barracks fire in the Presidio in, in San Francisco. So he's thrown himself into his work to, to try and get through the sadness. But here are our three guys. These, these are our three choices. Well, Funston helps the process. He dies. He has a heart attack in a Kansas City hotel and dies. So now we're down to Leonard Wood and John Pershing. Both very Republican, very close to Teddy Roosevelt, and Woodrow Wilson was not close to Teddy Roosevelt. In fact, he considered him just one step below the Kaiser as far as who the enemies of his, his regime were. Problem with Leonard Wood is he's well-connected, and he tells everybody he's well-connected. He can't keep his mouth shut. And so it was really a very easy choice. So Newton Baker and Woodrow Wilson say, we want John Pershing to lead the, the army. So what kind of an army are we going to build? Well, we're going to build it out of three kinds of soldiers. We've got regular army soldiers. We've got National Guardsmen. And then we're going to start drafting folks. And if you take a look at this map, to, you can see how the, uh, this was done with perfect army clarity. Uh, we're going to assign the Army National Guard is going to receive division numbers because everything's got to be a number. You can't have anything in the Army without having a number. We're going to assign the Army is going to have the divisions to be numbered from 26 to 42. Very good. So how do we, how do we assign them to the different states? Well, you'd go to New England and you make it 26. All those states together become one division. New York becomes the 27th. Pennsylvania becomes the 28th. New Jersey, Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, and District of Columbia become the 29th. Kind of see the pattern? It's going right down the coast, sticking guys together into making divisions. And we're still organized that same way today by these same numbers. And it follows all the way to you get all the way up to Washington State with the 41st Division. And that's when uh, MacArthur, who was the chief of staff and also working in the National Guard Bureau, came up with the brilliant idea of having a 42nd division. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the most ready units from all the states and put them in that, and they're going to reach across America like a rainbow. And that's how we get the rainbow division. So 26 states contributed to that, to that division. And, and if you look at the patch, there's a specific reason why the colors of that patch are red, yellow, and blue. Artillery, cavalry, infantry. So those are the three colors of the line and it's also the rainbow that spread across the country. Now, this is what a division looked like in those days. And you'll note some of the regiments have changed. John, since in World War II, some of the numbers have changed because later on, these, uh, some of these units will, will be sent to other states. But for right now, the 29th Division is going to be formed, and it's going to have 28,000 soldiers. And you can see it's got two regiments from New Jersey, the 113th and 114th. It's got the 115th from Maryland, the 116th from Virginia, and on and on and on. 28,000 guys. And there's also two machine gun, or three machine gun battalions I didn't show on there, but that's... This is what a United States Army division brought to the fight. I mean, we're talking 17,000 rifles in one division. I mean, these were massive organizations. What it isn't listed on there is also the fact that there are over 10,000 horses and mules assigned to carry all this equipment. Now, we got to start sending our guard and our, our, our draftee units. They've got to be sent somewhere to train. So the 29th Division is centered right in Maryland, New Jersey, Virginia, and they get orders to go to Alabama. Why are we going to send them to Alabama? We've got this place called Fort Lee is getting ready to be built, or Camp Lee. Well, it's really simple. Money. If you look at the map again, and this is really kind of important, you see the, the black dots are going to be where we're going to build those draftee divisions, 
the guys that, that haven't served before, we're going to give them a cadre of guys from regular Army. We're going to give them some officers. But those are going to be draft E divisions. The open circles are the guard divisions training facilities. Now, they don't need as much training. They're going to go first to Europe. And, and because they've already been trained a lot, this, will, this makes perfect sense. Unfortunately, the Congress only gave them enough money to build, to pay for 16 of the 32 training camps we need. So uh, what do you do? Well, the guards got tents. Let's put the guard in tents and let's send them south. And so that's why you see almost all the circles that are open are down below the Mason-Dixon line. What a great money savings. We're going to put the guard in tents. They're only going to be there a short while, and then we'll send them to France, and so we'll save all this money. Now, the other guys with the black dots, those are going to be full, full-blown full facilities, kind of like some of the, the Norfolk things. This is going to be a, the world's biggest construction program. They're going to build all these camps, and you'll see that the, the guard is down south. Most of these other guys are up north. But the question always comes up, and there will always be somebody who's going to ask, why did you name a camp for McClellan in Alabama? <laughs> you know, why is Sheridan down in the south? It's a simple process. The Army needed to give names to over 200 facilities, 200 camps. There were these 32 big ones, but they had all these other hundreds of little training camps for specialties. And so they said, we're going to name our camps for someone who is either specifically important to the people training there or to that region. So think about what that means. In Virginia, we got Camp Lee. Well, that's pretty obvious. But McClellan down in Alabama. Well, that's because most of the 29th Division came from New Jersey. McClellan was from New Jersey. Pretty simple. Uh, Sheridan. Most of the Sheridan's guys came from, uh, from Indiana and Illinois. That's where he was from. So it was a simple process. That's why Camp Meade, which is where the Pennsylvania guys trained, is in Maryland. But uh, they were running, running fast on these names. And, and you'll see there are a lot of names that we don't even recognize today. I had no idea who Donovan was until I started researching this process. And again, these, some of these guys were heroes that were actually fought in the War of 1812. Camp Pike down in Arkansas was named for Zebulon Pike. Uh, the guy who, who climbed Pike's Peak and, and put that on the map and then was killed up attacking Canada. So a lot of these guys are, are people we aren't all that familiar with, but they were familiar with them back in that period. Camp Shelby, for example, there are over eight counties in different states named after Shelby, and we don't even know who he was except that he was a, a Revolutionary War guy and later became a judge. So it, it's, it's significant because you'll see a lot of mocking today of the Army for having a base named for, you know, Bragg and Beauregard. I mean, these guys were second-class generals. Well, it didn't really matter. What was important was those camps were in strategic places, and so that's why they've survived. Uh, you want to guess what the name of the Army camp at Gettysburg was called? Samuel Colt. has absolutely no relationship to the Battle of Gettysburg. Or any, but, and the same thing, uh, you notice a couple of uh, Alamo uh, leaders for the obvious reasons in, in Texas. So you've got the guard in the south, you've got the draftees in the north, and they start training. And, and if any of you are, are Army veterans here, we grew up in an Army where you trained at a location in your specialty, and then you went to your unit. This was not their model. Their model was, I'm going to build a division at Camp Cody, and that's going to include infantry, artillery, cavalry, signal, engineers, and they're all going to train together at the same base. So each one of these was a complete divisional base. There was no going to Fort Lee to learn to be a quartermaster or go to Fort Sill to learn how to shoot artillery. You did everything at that base with your division. That was their, their philosophy and their doctrine at the time. Towards the end of the war, they realized this was kind of a flawed method. And so what they were going to do if the war had lasted longer was turn these East Coast bases into infantry training centers because that's where the greatest need for replacements was. But there is a, a definite difference in doctrine then and now for So America needs soldiers. We've got a leader, we've got bases, but it's still not enough. America needs to get a big army because obviously we're going to be in the war to win it. So that's when they start the draft. And, and one thing that's different from them 
and their period to ours is they didn't call them draftees. See, they, they were smarter than we were. They called them selectees. So it's like it's more of an honor. We selected you. We didn't draft you. you were, so you're, once you're selected, you're always respected. And here's how they did it. The first draft was going to grab all the men from age 21 to 31. That's a lot of guys. That's a lot of guys. And so they were going to, one day, all those guys were told to report to the local draft board. Now, one thing that the Army was going to do different from the Civil War when drafting had been a, a, a terrible fiasco was it was going to be under civilian control. This time, there wouldn't be an Army officer there judging your fitness to join the service. It was going to be the local banker and the mayor, the dentist, all these guys. So they built these draft boards. They built over 4,000 draft boards across the country. And you would report to your local draft board, and you'd fill out a card saying, I don't think I can go. My mother needs me. I only have one eye. Whatever your excuses were, or I have no exemptions. I'm ready to serve. And most guys were actually ready to serve. What was surprising, at least to me, and, and I don't know about other historians in the crowd, was we got an image of these guys as being very robust and healthy in that period. And they really, they weren't much better than us. There were, there were a lot of guys that were underweight, overweight, had grown up with rickets. Had, so, so here you're thinking, man, 21 to 31, that's a huge population of guys to build this army. And we're weeding them out just as fast because it, it was surprising. In some states, as many as 40% were physically unqualified to join the service. So what happened? We don't have enough guys to build this huge army. We're going to expand the draft from 21 to 31. Now we're making it 18 to 45. Holy moly. You know how that's over 20 million men now have to sign up for the draft. And it doesn't matter who you are or where you are, you still have to sign up. If you're an immigrant who's just been in the country two weeks and you have a New York City residence, sign up. If you'd come to this country in 1910 and and you'd filled out an immigrant form saying, you know, someday I think I might like to become a citizen of the United States, sign up. If you came in and you said, no, I don't think I want to be a citizen. I'm just going to be here to work and go back, sign up. If you're living here, you have to sign up for the draft. The board will then decide whether you're exempted from serving or not. But everybody had to sign up. And I was kind of shocked also to find out that, uh, you know, that policy still remained in effect, at least until Vietnam. I was talking to a warrant officer friend of mine, and he was actually from Canada, working in Detroit in, the, in a car factory. He got drafted. Working in Detroit, he was from Manitoba, and he got drafted and ended up in Vietnam. So, so this is nothing, you know, this continued, this, this process continued into modern days. What was really interesting was with these immigrants. What do we do with all these immigrants? We've got, you know, millions of them in this country. A lot of them are German, Austrian, Turkish. Even more Italians, Polish, Irish, Scandinavians, Icelanders, Argentinians. What do we do with all these guys? So they said, here's what we're going to do. First of all, we determine if they're healthy. That puts them in one category. And then we'll worry about if we're going to draft them. You're from Germany. You want to be an American. You probably could have gotten out of the draft. You could probably say, look, I, 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 I'm an, what they called an enemy alien because I'm one of the warring countries against the United States. But most of them didn't, and that's kind of surprising that most of these guys, even though they could have opted out of it, actually went in and, and, and signed up and went off to serve. So that by the time we, the Army was built and the armistice came along, 20% of our Army was, was foreign-born. It's just an amazing story. These guys that, that really you thought could have got out of it. In the meantime, there was a lot of humor. All the guys that said that you know, 32 years old said, man, I'd have been there with you. And then all of a sudden, the new regulation came out and said, sorry, you are now one of us. And this was interesting. Here's the, every man must register. You must register. And it says, and read the other side carefully. And you flip it on the other side, there's some more instructions, including one that says, if you have friends that don't speak English very well, bring them with you. You can help them. And so everybody's going to, because, so, but think about it. 20 million guys have registered for the draft, so. And here they are. They're getting ready to go. They're, they're very enthusiastic. They're Berlin-bound. Although in this case, they're just really going to Camp Mead from Philadelphia. But, but it looks very dramatic. Now, that first draft was the guys that were the 21 to 31-year-olds. 
those guys were, were considered like the cream of the crop. And if you read a lot of the World War I histories, those early units that went to France, those were those tall guys that were in Amanda's film. Those were the guys that were, you know, they were at the prime of their youth. They were, they were college guys. They were, you know, very well, they were, they were the healthy ones. Now when you start getting into the 45-year-old category and 18-year-old, you got guys that aren't quite as, as robust and healthy. And, and here's a picture from Avon, New York, of this group of the second wave of draftees. And you can see most of them look like they'd rather be somewhere else. So let's talk real quickly about Camp McClellan, Virginia National Guard. I have to pay some, some homage to it. Camp McClellan is a tent camp. Remember, the guards got tents, got eight-man tents. We're going to put them in those because they aren't going to be there very long. And by God, we'll get them trained and we'll get them off to France and, and they'll be super troopers. What they didn't take into account was that the winter of 1917, 1918 was the harshest in the South in 50 years. You could see in the upper right-hand corner one of the areas of the camp covered in snow. One of our favorite artillery units, the 111th Field Artillery from right around this area with the uh, Norfolk Light Artillery Blues and all, they spent most of the winter not training but scavenging for firewood because they were freezing down there. And everybody that was in these, even the New York guys who were training in South Carolina sent home all these scathing reports about the hell of the sunny south. You know, I wish I was back in Utica. So, so you got Camp McClellan. These are what the National Guard camps look like, 16 of them across the country. But what about the National Army divisions? Now, they got it a little different. They're up north, and, and you know the winter's going to be rough for them, but they're going to live in actually in wooden, in wooden barracks and train and a lot of times undercover. This was the standard army format for a camp. They'd sat down, they'd taken the, the time to actually figure out, and every army camp that was gonna be built was gonna look exactly like this. It was gonna be a U-shape with the headquarters in the middle, parade grounds, it was gonna have the infantry regiments there, the artillery regiments there, a depot brigade that supported the whole camp to make sure everybody was trained and also to provide replacements and then you've got more training battalions, and then you've got all the other support troops on this side with all their horses, and every one of them was hooked to a railhead because now the railhead is critically important for getting these guys from their camps to the East Coast to get them onto the ships. So this is the standard of exactly how a National Army camp would look. And you can tell it's pretty darn close. Uh, you know, take a look at that, that rail line is about as close as you can get to those warehouses. And then you move right over and you can see the row after row of these barracks. Every one of these barracks was built to the same plan. So they knew exactly how many U-bolts, how many I-bolts, how much lumber, how many windows, how many latches each barracks needed. And so they would come to these camps in kits and they would just build them. And it's the same thing over and over across the country. These huge, this is why this was a, a giant construction project and in many cases, especially in the Midwest and out further west, these camps became one of the largest cities in the state. Here's how Fort Lee looked. Fort Lee was, uh, was an exception to the shape because of the geography. If you go on Fort Lee today, that center area is still undeveloped and is part of the golf course and still has a massive trench complex that sits up high. So they built kind of like a big open you, but the same plan was you got the railhead, you got the infantry, artillery, support troops, it was a guy named Adelbert Cronkite, and he was a, a well thought of general, and he was a distant relative of Walter Cronkite, but Cronkite was a believer that the way to survive was to build good trenches, so he turned that entire center complex into a massive training trench, and it ran all the way around and onto where the battlefield is, is located. And so today, if you go on to Fort Lee, this will be one of the things that you'll be able to see this year during the centennial, is get a chance to visit what's left of these training complexes and this trench complex, probably the biggest one on the East Coast, maybe the biggest one east of the Mississippi. And, and very few people know it's there because they all assume it's civil war. Now, when Cronkite, who's gonna lead the 80th division, a draft E division over to France, goes to France for his pre-deployment visit with General Pershing, He's telling him, sir, this is what I did. I've got a training complex second to none. I've got more trenches than you can say. You wouldn't believe how good my trench complex is. 
I don't want you training these guys in trenches. I want these guys out in the open. I want them using, moving, shooting, and communicating and attacking. So Cronkite comes back, and he's kind of chastened, but nevertheless, his trenchers remain. This is a standard barracks for a national army. You can see every one of them was the same. If they put you down in the middle of Camp Dodge or Camp Kearney, you'd find your way to a bedroom, you'd find your way to a chow hall, you'd know where the first sergeant was. Every one of them was built the same for barracks. So what do they look like? Man, they were packed. Uh, you saw that the, the numbers that they were supposed to have in there, that went out the window quickly. Uh, you know, this, these guys were, were shoved in there as packed as they could make them so that later when the Spanish flu came to visit the East Coast and move west, these guys died like flies in these, in these barracks because they were so packed in together. And you can see the, the only real furniture in there besides their bed is this ingenious contraption for holding their mess kits. Here's an example. Camp Lee, troop capacity, 49,000. The highest total was during July, September, and October. If you remember, when were the worst months of the Spanish flu? September and October. And so Camp Lee, you stood a better chance in the Meuse Argonne in some units than you did being a doughboy at Camp Meade, Camp Dix, Camp Sherman, Camp Lee because so many died of the flu there. It got so bad at, at Camp Sherman, they were losing 100 a day. The guy would wake up in the morning healthy, and then he'd be dead by night. That the uh, post commander killed himself. He, he, he couldn't take it anymore. He was tired. Of, uh, he couldn't handle burying all these doughboys. It was just relentless. You can see, remember, the chow hall was at the far end, and that was also the training room. Now, for those of us that remember the 60s and fly strips, it's right over where their plates and cups and stuff. So, I, I, again, they were, it was not a, the healthiest of environments for them. And, and I'll go through this quickly because I don't want to wear you out on, on the story of, of what it was like being a doughboy. But chances are you were not going to stay with the unit you went to originally. There was a guy April 15th in Parkersburg, West Virginia, got his draft notice. By this point, the armies decided all those regular army, national guard, draft D divisions, I can't support three personnel systems. The next guy in goes to the next unit that needs them. The next guy in goes to the next unit that needs them. So here's a draft E coming in, and he's being sent to the, uh, to the Ohio, uh, first he goes to, the, to a, a draft E division from uh, Pennsylvania, the 316th Infantry. One month later, he's in the 112th Engineers. One day later, he's now a National Guardsman in the 37th Infantry Regiment. And a few days later, he's now in the Machine Gun Company. So you see, he's changed units four times in the matter of two months because they're trying to get guys out the door as fast as they can. They're pushing them to the East Coast. We've got to get guys on these ships because, you know, Pershing is over there with actually a very small army until the summer of 1918. So he leaves uh, June 12th. He leaves Camp Lee. He says, we don't know where we're going, but we're on our way. June 24th, he arrives in, in, the, in the port of Brest. Gets a couple days to rest from the ship. Took a hike. Nothing much doing. A couple days later, now he's starting to get his gas mask and his helmet. Notice He's already in France, and he still hasn't had his helmet and his gas mask issued to him yet. So he gets his helmet and gas mask on the 21st of July, and nine days later, they're in a defensive sector in the front line, and their guys are already being killed by German aircraft. So that's 100 days from, from being home to being in the front lines. I mean, that's, that's the kind of training cycle we're getting at, at these times. Picture in your mind being a, uh, an Italian guy who doesn't speak very much English, and you've been in four units, it's a, it's a tough, it's a very difficult. And here's a guy who uh, wrote a letter about Camp Lee. I liked Camp Lee. I worked there a long time. But he says, I would never, I thought I'd never reach the damn place, just like going to prison. And then, of course, here's another guy who said, you know, this Army, the food's pretty good, and I like the other guys, but I don't like the Army very much. No. Welcome to the Army, Helmer. And this is why we're getting guys to the East Coast. We've got to push them to France. We're going to bring them out of the ports. And as you can see, Newport News is one of the bigger shipping areas for the ports. 
So what did the Army look like? Here's two Virginia National Guardsmen, pretty common. But the Army also looked like this guy. He's a, you know, he's a Westerner. He's bigger than most of the guys in the, in the East Coast units. Here's a deep Southern guy from Alabama. Here's a couple of African-American guys. This is what the Army's starting to look like, because remember, everybody was eligible. Universal conscription means everybody, except women. And we got these college guys that are going to become the officers. Full-blooded Ojibwe Indians in the Wisconsin National Guard. Uh, there's an interesting picture at our guard headquarters of a platoon from Minnesota that is half Indian and half Norwegian. Imagine the communication issues of trying to get those guys from one street, but And then, of course, you've got the, uh, the Italian immigrants have come in with their tattoos. Uh, we've got Chinese guys from the uh, Hawaiian Guard. We've got Mexican guys. Imagine, 12 months earlier, we were fighting in Mexico, and yet 5,000 of these guys crossed the border to join the American Army. That's uh, just an amazing story. And closer to home, here's a guy from Newport News and another guy from Petersburg. So in conclusion, what do we know about to hell with the Kaiser and build in an army? Number one, if you're going to take on the Germans, bring all your friends. We need 32 main training camps because we're going to put 32 of these big divisions in the front lines and we're going to dominate the battlefield. Uh, if you're a Virginian, Chances are you're in either the 29th Division or the 80th Division because that's where the draftees were in the 80th and the guard in the 29th. And the bottom line is, send the word. The Yanks are coming. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please contact Amanda Williams at amanda.williams at norfolk.gov.